friends, what if drinking water at night could do more than just quench your thirst? What if it could protect your brain, improve your blood pressure, boost fat burning, and it could help your heart? Now, most people assume that water is something that you sip on when you're thirsty, but the amount and timing of when you drink it, especially at night, might matter more than you think. So in this video, we'll explore the science, some myths, and the surprising benefits and risks of drinking water at night. And by the end, you'll know how to use the right water, not just to quench your thirst, but to optimize your health, recovery, and longevity. Plus, I'll give you a bonus on how you can tell if you or someone you know is dehydrated. So let's start with why this even matters. Now let's think about what dehydration does to your body. It thickens your blood, it raises your blood pressure. Unless you get really dehydrated, then it'll lower it. It stresses your kidneys, it slows down your brain. So dehydration, it actually worsens overnight because not only are you not drinking water, but you're losing water while you sleep by breathing, sweating, and urinating. And if you go to bed, even slightly dehydrated, you run the risk of waking up more groggy, maybe with a headache, dry mouth, and maybe even constipated. These are all signs of dehydration. Now they say over 75% of Americans are chronically dehydrated. Now we can debate about that number, but the truth is the older you are, the less your body is able to help you from getting dehydrated. And old starts when you're 30. Hydration is just not about quenching your thirst. It's about how your body regulates water and electrolytes, blood pressure, brain function, kidney filtration, bowel movements, metabolism, body temperature, and your immunity. And if you go to bed already slightly dehydrated, you're simply gonna wake up with thicker blood, potentially higher blood pressure, brain fog, constipation, and sometimes even confusion. It's not a coincidence that most strokes and heart attacks happen early in the morning. Now that's partly because blood is more concentrated and sticky during that time due to a variety of factors. However, could dehydration control to that. Now, most people avoid drinking water before bed for one simple reason. They just don't want to get up and pee, right? You don't want to urinate in the middle of the night. It interrupts your sleep. Hey, I get it. I don't blame people. That's a very valid point. That condition is called nocturia, waking up to urinate. It can disrupt your sleep quality and impair you from getting into deep, restful sleep. And that leaves you tired the next day. But what if the reason you're peeing at night isn't because you're drinking too late or drinking too much water. What if it's because you have a urinary tract infection, maybe an overactive bladder? How about obesity? That by itself can cause nocturia. How about uncontrolled high blood pressure? What about excessive blood sugar? How about depression, reflux, heart failure, prostate problems? Do you have restless leg or obstructive sleep apnea? If these conditions are undiagnosed or poorly controlled, even if you skipped drinking water, you're gonna get up in the middle of the night to urinate. You have to get to the root cause. And everybody is blaming nighttime peeing on water, but it may not be from that. But if you drink water correctly in the right amount at night, you can actually improve your health, not worsen it. The key is is timing, quantity, and what else is or isn't in your water. Now, my brother makes sure that his kids all drink a tall glass of water before bedtime. I also drink water before bedtime. This is my glass of water that I drink at night. However, I don't have those uncontrolled health conditions that I listed above. It's super important not to ignore peeing at night. It's not just an inconvenience. You need to get to the root cause and please see your own medical doctor to find out why. Bring the list that I just gave you and ask your doctor. Could you help me make sure that I don't have these things? And if I do, how can I fix them? Because keeping hydrated is the number one pillar of health. Our bodies are 50 to 70% water, depending on the organ part. Water isn't just a fluid. It's a transport system. It dissolves and distributes electrolytes like sodium and potassium. It flushes out toxins. It powers your metabolism and even regulates your body temperature. It's the solvent for every biochemical reaction that happens inside your body. And hydration is not just about water. It's about the balance of water and electrolytes. And that's why the body uses the sodium glucose transporter. It's called SGLT1 
to pull water into your cells more efficiently. But you have to have both glucose and sodium. And that's why plain water isn't always enough, especially if you're fasting or starving or excessively exercising or sick, throwing up, having fevers or having diarrhea. Now, this occurs when you're not able to eat solid food, right? So drinking large volumes of plain water without electrolytes can actually make things worse by diluting your sodium and triggering hyponatremia neutremia, a dangerous condition in which you have low sodium where the cells can swell, including your brain. Now this rarely ever happens when you're able to urinate and eat solid food. But occasionally you hear on the news about people doing extreme competitions that appear harmless, but are in fact super harmful. This also happens in people who don't eat. And if you're on extreme diets, like a ketogenic diet, you too run the risk of getting dehydrated. Plus, you're not eating any sugar, any glucose, which reduces the efficiency of water absorption to cross the small intestine. And excess sodium, unfortunately, it does not make up for the problem. In fact, excess sodium causes the body to be more dehydrated. Could nighttime hydration influence blood pressure patterns? Normally, your blood pressure should dip at night. That process is called nocturnal internal dipping. But in certain people, especially people on a high sodium diet, their blood pressure may not dip as it should. These non-dippers, they are at significantly higher risk of having a cardiac or heart event, like a heart attack or a stroke in the early morning hours. And this is exactly why electrolyte drinks filled with sodium should not be regularly consumed. People falsely believe sports drinks hydrate better than water. Yeah, you only need it if you're losing large amounts of water and electrolytes. Otherwise, for the average normal healthy eating person, I'm not sure the artificial ingredients, the excess artificial sugars, the food coloring, the sugar itself, and the excess sodium is good for your body. It's probably doing more harm than good. Now, playing a little recreational sports, yeah, I don't think that requires recreational sports electrolyte drinks. Most people don't have a problem with sodium deficiency when they're eating an abundant of sodium in their solid food, eating the standard American diet. That's literally convenient, processed, prepackaged foods. But let's face it, the majority of people, they don't have high sodium from drinking electrolyte drinks or from adding salt to their food. They get it from this list of foods. You eat any of these? People falsely think that when they eat more salt, that they'll just make it up by drinking more water. But in reality, it doesn't work because in real life, your body is unable to make up for the amount of salt that you eat. Your thirst is not a good gauge on how much you need to drink to keep up with your water deficit when you're eating an excessive amount of salt. Sure, sodium is essential. Nobody argues with that. So are certain amino acids and literally so is water. It doesn't mean you can overconsume any of them and not have consequences. There's a reason why you can't drink seawater, right? Hi friends, I am so thrilled that you wanna take charge of your health and take charge of your food. Now I know nutrition can be complex, but it doesn't have to be. And I'm here to support you in this lifelong journey. So if you point your camera app to this QR code, it'll take you to a link for a free handout that I created just for you. And if you like it, if you wanna see other handouts, please go to the link in my show notes and then you can leave me your feedback on what I could do to help you in your journey. Okay, back to the video now. So when you eat sodium in excess, did you know that it doesn't actually stay in your bloodstream? Yes. Some of it actually leaks out into your tissue and wherever sodium goes, water flows. So that's how you get edema, which is very, very common as swollen legs, right? So if you push on your legs, do you leave an indentation? That's called pitting edema. But you're also gonna notice swelling in other parts of your body, like your hands and your feet, and also your joints. Don't believe me? Record when you're eating out or when you're eating more conveniently processed packaged foods. And then follow your blood pressure before and after you do that. Trend it for a few days. And you'll watch what happens to your blood pressure. Don't be surprised that it's gonna trend up or that you'll wake up with achy joints or feeling more short of breath on the following days. And if you don't feel anything, that's great. But if you start feeling worse or if your blood pressure is abnormally rising too high or too low, contact your medical doctor ASAP. And you're gonna need one of these, a blood pressure meter, to know what your blood pressure is doing. So let me show you how to use one. 
Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is look for a marker on your blood pressure cuff and where to put your artery. Now, you're gonna measure an artery. It's called the anti-cubital fossa. It's like the joint of your elbow. So you're gonna put that in. You wanna make sure you're wearing short sleeves because sometimes your cuff won't be able to feel your pulse and your blood pressure to make an accurate measurement. Now, you're going to secure this where it's snug. And then we're just gonna press the start button. You wanna make sure you sit with your legs uncrossed. Now, ideally your elbow is the same height as your heart. Now they say you're supposed to rest for about 15 minutes, stop talking, etc. But I tend to check it in real life to see what is happening to my blood pressure. When I'm stressed, not stressed, when I first wake up, when I go to bed at night. And so this way I have a good sense of how my blood pressure fluctuates with my emotions and activities. So I'm pressing the start button and I'm gonna turn the meter this way so you guys can see it, right? Okay, 103 over 74 and my heart rate is 67. You're probably wondering how much water is enough and how much is too much. Well, during my medical residency, I often skipped drinking water to avoid bathroom breaks during long shifts. And I would wake up at night with leg cramps and brain fog. Eventually I realized I was going to bed dehydrated. And now I always drink a glass of water at night after dinner so I can sleep better. I wake up without like parched mouth and dry tongue, right? Right? And I rarely get any cramps unless I've overworked myself during Pilates. But how much you need isn't an easy question because it depends on how well your heart works, how well your kidneys filter, how much water and electrolytes that you're actually losing in a day, and how fast you are breathing. For those of you with organ issues, your doctor will tell you if you're on a fluid restriction. If you're not sure, make sure you ask them. And for the rest of us, people who are healthy, if you're sweating more, you're breathing faster from exercise exercising or from the heat or if you're having fevers, you're probably going to need more water. Whatever you're drinking, consider adding 1.5 liters more in a day. And I'll tell you why later. If you drink too much before bed and forget to pee right before bed, yeah, sure, you may be waking up in the middle of the night to go use a bathroom. But if you don't drink enough, you risk overnight dehydration. So my glass of water is consumed after dinner, but two hours before bedtime. That helps me sleep better so I'm not getting in the middle of the night urinating. This gives my kidneys some time to filter the fluid without waking me up. But it's also not advantageous to like gulp this whole thing. I drink this slowly. I sip it. That's actually the key. And when you drink too quickly, your cells may not absorb it as efficiently. The body's absorption mechanism, it works best with smaller volumes delivered gradually, allowing for better electrolyte and water transport across your intestinal walls. And by the way, you don't always need those expensive sports drinks or hydration packets. In fact, most are filled with artificial sweeteners. Not only mess your gut microbiome, but it also impairs your glucose metabolism. And these sweeteners, they often increase gut inflammation. They worsen insulin resistance and they can even trigger diarrhea, which is counterproductive from what you're trying to do. Stay hydrated. But if you really like them, you can actually make your own oral hydration solution using ingredients from your kitchen. And if you want to use a proven oral hydration solution that costs pennies to make, use the World Health Organization formula, which includes one liter of water, six teaspoons of sugar, and half a teaspoon of salt. Now, you can always add a splash of fruit juice or a pinch of potassium chloride, which is a salt substitute to meet your potassium needs. If you're eating regular meals, your food already provides the necessary electrolytes and glucose you need to absorb water efficiently. But if you're fasting for days, sick, or losing excessive fluid, fluids through your sweats or vomiting or having diarrhea, plain water just isn't enough. Coconut water, diluted fruit juice or broths can be better options for maintaining hydration without disrupting your gut or hormones. Now broths, particularly from vegetable sources, can provide warmth, potassium, and other minerals. But be careful, some broths have excessive salt. And once you start eating, you may wanna back down on the broth. Another idea would be to add some potassium salt as a substitute, which helps maintain a sodium-potassium balance. Now remember, potassium is an intracellular counterpart of sodium. Both are critical for your nerve to function, your heart to beat, and for your hydration. But if your kidneys aren't working, you shouldn't be adding excessive potassium. 
you should really check with your medical doctor if you have any kidney problems. Now, here are some myths that I just want to clarify. Have you heard that drinking water before bed causes kidney strain? Yeah, that's pretty much false. The kidneys are more capable of filtering nighttime fluid as long as you don't overdo it. Water is also critical for memory consolidation and detoxification. Your brain has a glymphatic system that clears waste during deep sleep and it needs fluid, water, to work. And this is another reason why good hydration supports cognitive function and may even reduce your risk of dementia. Now, for people who sleep less than six hours, sometimes they tend to be more dehydrated. And if you're elderly, dehydration increases your risk of confusion, falls, and increases emergency room visits. Roughly about 9% of ER visits are related to dehydration and urinary tract infections. And increasing your water intake by one and a half liters and actually has been shown to reduce the recurrence of urinary tract infections in women by nearly 50%. And that's why I said increase the amount of fluid that you drink by 1.5 liters, no matter where you're at right now, unless you have a fluid restriction. You know, there's a billion dollar industry focusing on supplements for health, but people skip the most foundational element, water. And it's not just water, but again, how you drink it and when you drink it. If your morning begins with fatigue, dry mouth and lightheadedness, those are signs of dehydration. Your body is likely sending you a message, hydrate smarter. Think of hydration as something you build during the day so that your body enters the night well hydrated and your nighttime drink may be strategic to help you recover better. And remember drinking water at night isn't just about hydration. It's really a tool for health, for metabolism, for longevity. But like everything else, the key is doing it right. The right amount, the right timing, and the right type of water. And this small change could transform your mornings, protect your brain, and reduce the risk of illness. And it's literally practically free. Now keep in mind, if you don't like water and you're gushing down coffee and tea, well, they're not really water. Both contain caffeine. Coffee though has three times more caffeine than tea, which can mess with your metabolism and make you urinate even more. So if you're trying to rehydrate, you may wanna not overdo caffeine, especially at night. But I admit coffee is a longevity drink. And if you wanna learn more about that, watch the next video.